farm of Whitespog is located deep in the heart of the New Jersey Pine Barrens. Owing to the acidic sandy soil, the Pinelands have always been a difficult area to farm. Most cultivated crops do poorly here, and this region escaped the agricultural expansion of the 18th and 19th century. But this is a place rich in history and tradition. Joseph Josiah White became one of the first to believe in the future of cultivating local berry species, and more than a hundred years ago at Whitesbog, developed the largest cranberry farm in the state. It was also here that his daughter, Elizabeth White, worked to develop the first domesticated crops of blueberries. Whitesbog is a relatively large community for the pines. More than a dozen people worked here year-round, and a century ago, the population swelled to over 600 men, women, and children in the fall when it came time to hand harvest the enormous cranberry crop. While the preserved buildings and landscapes at Whitesbog tell us much about life in this village when it comes to a working farm, they cannot tell us what people experienced as they lived and worked here. Historians often find themselves unable to find even the most meager comments from the past and wonder what they would learn if only these walls could speak. At Whitesbog, we are fortunate. We have preserved many of the voices of those who worked and lived here. Join us for a brief sample of some of the experiences and memories of the residents who worked and lived in Whitespot and built a farm that is an important part of American history. <laughs> we used to go on a ferry boat from Philly and then they used to put us on a train and uh, take us to the, the station and then they would pick us up with the wagon. <laughs> I just hated the blueberry field. Simple as that, I hated it. <laughs> It was close, which made a good environment for people to have, be happy. And that's why I attribute it to the best years of my life. I'm a piney, you know, and I knew all the rest of the pines. Open eyed wonder for me to see all of this, how people live. It was kind of like a, a Huck Finn, Tom Sawyer type of, of existence. Clusters of houses that were empty in the winter and seemingly full of kids in the summer. There are actually three villages on the farm. Whitesbog Village, as well as the villages of Florence and Rome, named by the Italian-American workers for the great cities of their native country. There were also many different cultures on this one farm. In addition to the Italians who lived in Philadelphia and traveled out to the pines for the harvests, there were local residents of British and German ancestries who had lived in the pines for generations, as well as African American, Portuguese, and Puerto Rican immigrants. Couldn't wait until you're 12 years old to get your working permit right. because everybody else worked and wouldn't have any television or anything. You wanted to work, you wanted to do what everybody else did. It was fun, it was work, but it was fun. We made fun of it. We used to sing in the fields and tell jokes and carry on. And while we were working, we, and we enjoyed it. We made a fun thing out of it. You didn't pick blueberries and like put them in a bucket. You picked, you used to get like the old olive oil cans and they used to take the tops off and clean them out real good and put rope in the holes on the sides that you make and make knots. And then you would get them and put them around your waist and they would hang down and as you would pick, you would just automatically drop them into the can and then dump them in the bucket. Our fingers would get all, you know, all, all, all the cuticles would, they used to bleed. You know where we used to put them? Salt and water. So remember cutting the vines, cutting through your fingers and everything while you were <laughs> picking? I had a lot of blue feet for a lot of years. A lot Very of years. Nice. I wouldn't buy a blueberry. I don't want no blueberry pie. I don't want blueberry anything. <laughs> That's how much I hated them feels. 
I was one of the fortunate ones. I didn't have to pick blueberries. I used to work on a blueberry truck with my father because he used to go to the uh, packing shed. Children were taught to put their fingers at the bottom of the plant and bring it up with their hands full of cranberries. Sometimes it was long and hard, but... Uh... Most of the time. And I don't mean to brag, but there was nobody, I mean, they tried, that could carry two bushels at one time up to the truck. I did. No, we packed, we were driven to a, a packing shed every early, very early every morning, and uh, each had your own stall, more or less, and had a machine for the tape. The biggest thing was you had to really um, look forward to your payday on on Saturday, and you'd go down and you'd walk in and get paid in cash, and you'd come out and you'd say, wow, what a week, $35. I just hated it with a passion. You went out there and you was in that sun all day long, and we used to pray for rain. Now I don't know why, because after it rained, they made us go right back out in the field and pick, and then you had to pick in the wet bushes. Some of my playmates was uh, Freddie Haynes and Buddy uh, uh, Jefferson, and we used to uh, work like in the nurseries, uh, putting out, setting out cuttings. This is a, a cranberry scoop. I couldn't wait until I was 12 years old so I could go out and scoop the cranberries instead of pick them by hand. So this was inserted into the vines and then rocked back again and pulled loose so the cranberries would stay inside and the vines, what weren't, weren't pulled out by the roots, would be left outside. And I was in bed for two days with fevers and everything from all the, the muscles that I used that I overused uh, that first day that I went out to scoop. Five, six hundred people to hand pick the property and uh, then when the First World War came along, he couldn't get those people, so he went to scooping, and this is the scoop that was used, and with these scoops, uh, he could harvest the property with 150 scoopers. The crop was good in the sense, you know, there, the, the vines were so high and so, but you can grab it. And one, one swoop, you'd, up, you'd pick the whole darn thing up and put it in a bushel. No job that's easy in cranberries. You've got to have a good back to work in cranberries. But you could make a nice dollar, and that's what encouraged yeah. the, the people. At the time, there was Florence and Rome. Florence, I believe, was where the, the summer help would come down from the city. They'd bring them down on buses. And then Rome, you know, realized this is 1946, was all black. And uh, then there was the main town. When we lived in Rome, it were, they were like little apartments within the big structure. And there may be, I think there were like four, four components within that one building. No running water, because you had to go out and pump the water. No electricity, so we had the oil lamps. Italians lived in Florence when we lived in Rome. And they came down in the summertime. Yeah. Even though there was over 200 people there, it was like it was 200 people in the same family. I can't remember how, how, if you would say they were dressed poorly or what. I only remember the smiles on their faces. It was all nice and clean. They had all like uh, uh, sand. There was no grass around our buildings. The only two houses of the whole village that had water though, were the me. big house where my grandfather lived and that little house right next to it where her mother and father lived. Everybody else had to come to the pump which was right outside my grandfather's house, to pump buckets of water and basins and pots to do any kind of cooking or anything. We used to have inspection that they used to inspect your homes. On a Sunday, there'd be a special lady that would come around. And she'd look at our house, she'd go, that was my job, scrubbing all the floors. And my mom and my sister would wash clothes and all. And uh, I, I used to scrub them wooden floors on my knees, all of them. They were. You could eat off of them. We had like one big outhouse for everybody. But we used to keep it miraculously clean, really. I think there was about five houses, six houses all together. Yeah. There was five straight down and one off to the side. We had a wooden stove there with four lids you would take out from the top. And we used to cook in there and eat in there and all. And it was nice and warm there. 
We had no electricity. We had the kerosene lamps. Most of us were poor, but you didn't know you were poor because everybody was poor. We had a garden that had everything. My father used to plant everything. Tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, string beans, uh, potatoes, sweet potatoes, white potatoes, everything. Slim Tony was Portuguese. And then he used to sell us candy. He had part of his store was the candy store up in Rome where we could go buy our candy. And, and the joy they had with each other, besides the big, big sandwiches they ate. Cooked the same, ate the same kind of food. Well, we were Italians, of course, you know, we ate our spaghetti, we ate our chicken. <laughs> the favorite, the one I remember best of all, of course, was blueberries. I also remember chewing on cranberries. I sort of sucked on them. We did, we did have game food. We had a lot of game. My father was a hunter. Yes. We did have a lot of game food. We had rabbit, pheasant, and, and deer, venison. My grandmother was an excellent cook, but we are Italian, and in them days, money was tight, so it was spaghetti, 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 a lot. The general store, was, it was the grand building of Whitesbog. It so large and spacious and full of pleasures. It was just a great meeting place for people. And of course, we met there to go, get the bus to go in the morning. I always remember sitting there waiting for that bus to come across the dam. Of course, we had the store. Now, the store was like the center of activity in, the, in, in White's Bog at the time. I think we did most of our shopping here. Yeah. The general store. We used to walk down here to the store every night to get the newspaper, and then we'd come back. And if it was getting dark, we had to walk around a cedar swamp. We called this corner the cedar swamp mm -hmm. because the Jersey Devil lived in there. And all the pineys around here that lived around, this was the only place where they can come and buy food. And... In the evening, you'd go there. And if you just sat there, most of the people at White's Welcome would be there one time or another. The store had a post office. And our mom was the postmaster, or postmistress. It was just a fun place to be if you were a teenager. It was really a fun place to be in the summertime. Of course, we used to play uh, croquet, uh, games that kids would play. We, of course, during the winter time, we used to have fun ice skating. Lots of space around here to ice skate. My most vivid recollection of White's Bog as a kid three years old, was during the uh, one winter where everybody, quote, in downtown Whitesburg skated in the wintertime when it was frozen. And the, my brothers were out there skating one day, and I, as a three-year-old, was walking around and out on the ice walking around, and I walked off the edge of the ice into the water. Harmonizing and, and just, you know, making tapes, and everybody was always singing. I went to Rome many times. We had a few beers there, no, no problem. No, we Good were people. segregated, but in a friendly way. We yeah. weren't, uh, it was not because there was any kind of uh, conflicts or anything like that. Of course, after we were grown and had a little more sense, we figured out and we didn't know. We had actually lived on a plantation and didn't know it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we really didn't recognize it as a plantation as such, but in retrospect, that's what it was. But yet it was, uh, it was very acceptable. I mean, uh, we knew uh, where we were allowed to go and we're allowed to be and what we were allowed to do. And I think, and uh, when I think about it, my parents were very strict uh, in terms of what we could do uh, as far as uh, moving around the village. I don't think the people who owned the village did, did not place restrictions on us. It was the parents who did that. Elizabeth White was J.J. Uh, White, my grandfather's eldest daughter, eldest of four, and she was the only one of the four daughters who spent all of her life working with her father on the cranberries. There was this lovely woman, and I, it could be it was Elizabeth White, but I never came to know who she was. But uh, she sounds like such a great person, and if she is the one who gave medication, it shows you another side of this lady. She had a very distinctive voice, too, as I recall. I can't describe it, but I think I'd recognize it if I heard it out in the hall today. She used to always be in the fields talking to everybody and all, yeah. Talked to her quite a few times, 
and uh, she was a pleasant woman and real sociable and uh, a real congenial person. She was very much like a grandmother for me. My grandmother had passed on and I had wonderful times here with her. She was interested in everything that I was interested in, or I was interested in everything that she was interested in, I guess I should say. With Miss White, she was like a queen as far as we were concerned, and we were invited one time during our four, week, four or five weeks to high tea at Sun and Give, and that's the day you did not wear your overalls. She carried herself well, and as I recall, she drove a Franklin touring car, and she and that touring car, to me, were a matched pair. We're in the circular garden uh, east of Sun, Sun and Give, which was Miss White's home. I uh, lived here with her for about nine and a half years. I remember Sun and Give as such beautiful flowers. She collected many of her plants from the bogs as they were cleared. She would see a plant that she'd like, and she'd say, I want to take that with me. And she'd pick that up and bring it back here to the garden after Sun and Give was built. She liked the Pine Barren plant material, and she wanted to see it where she could uh, view it daily when she'd come out of the house. People would come from all over the world to see this garden. She was looking for another crop. She had, she knew the cranberries would uh, take only a small amount of the year for maintenance and for picking and so on. And she wanted to find something that she could keep them here on the bog all year round. If she really wanted to get ahead with the blueberry work, instead of going to foreign countries, she wanted to concentrate on Jersey only. And that way they would grow well, do well, and be much better than bringing in plant material from other countries. We were each given one of these vials with the blueberries that were at least that large. She was married to the blueberries. She loved the blueberry work, and she said that in the beginning, of course, when she got these, these brochures and she found that uh, blueberries needed the acid soil, she said, that's the crop I need. She says, we have the soil, we have the uh, open area between the cranberry bogs where we can clear the land. It's higher than the cranberry bogs. And I could hardly believe that I was going to be staying here. I uh, almost pinched myself several times because it was so different than any life I had ever lived. 